Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never lark nor ever eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. That poem is by John Gillespie McGee, Jr. He was both a pilot and a poet. His poem, High Flight, is perhaps the most well-known and best-loved verse in aviation history. The story of how McGee came to write his famous poem, and what happened to him afterwards, are not that well-known, however. When the Second World War broke out, the United States was a neutral country. It would be more than two years before Japan attacked at Pearl Harbor and America joined the fight. And like many men of his generation, McGee could not stand aside and watch as country after country fell to the Nazis. Therefore, he crossed the border into Canada and enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force. He was accepted into flight training in 1940, and a year later he had earned his wings. He was shipped off to England in July 1941, and unlike most Americans, for McGee, England wasn't some distant, faraway, unknown place. His mother was English, and he had done most of his schooling there. His father was an Anglican priest from America, and the two had met in China as missionaries and gotten married there. He was born in Shanghai in 1922, and when he finished his high school, he was accepted on a scholarship to Yale University, but he chose to fight instead. He had just turned 19 years old when he shipped off in July 1941. On arrival, he was posted to No. 53 OTU, flying from an airfield in Wales. McGee was put into the cockpit of a Supermarine Spitfire Mark I, and he had his first flight on August 7, 1941. Less than two weeks later, on his seventh flight, he took the Spitfire up to high altitude to get a feeling for how the plane handled in the thin air so far up. He coaxed it around and did wingovers, loops, and rolls. And as he flew along, he recalled the words of a poet who he had once studied in school, a man named Cuthbert Hicks. In the poem The Blind Man Flies, Hicks had ended it with these words, Now joy is mine through my long night. I do not feel the rod, for I have danced the streets of heaven and touched the face of God. After he landed, taking inspiration from Hicks, McGee worked the last line of the poem into his own. Two weeks later, he sent it to his parents on the back of a letter, writing, I am enclosing a verse I wrote the other day. It started at 30,000 feet and was finished soon after I landed. His father was serving at St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., located straight across from the White House and often called the President's Church. Being proud of his son, he had the poem printed in the church bulletins. Twenty days later, on September 23rd, about the time the poem was first read by the congregation, McGee was ready for combat. He was assigned to number 412 Fighter Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force, and they flew from the airfield at RAF Digby. The squadron upgraded to the newest model of the Spitfire, the Mark 5B, and began flying air defense and convoy escort missions right from the start. On November 8th, he flew as part of a 12-plane mission escorting a bomber command raid on the railway workshops in Lille, France. When his flight of four Spitfires crossed the French coast just east of Dunkirk, they were attacked by a squadron of Focke-Wulf FW-190A1 fighter planes, led by one of Germany's leading aces, a man named Joachim Munchberg. In the span of less than two minutes, the other three planes in McGee's flight were shot down, including his squadron commander. He barely escaped alive. Though he fired his guns, he claimed no damage done. A month later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. 
The next day, the United States declared war, and immediately, Hitler declared war on America. With two and a half months of combat operations already behind him, he continued to fly for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Just a few days later, sadly, on December 11th, McGee was killed. Not in action, but in an accident. His flight of four Spitfires had just completed a routine training mission above the clouds. They were practicing air combat maneuvering near the airfield at RAF Tangmere. When the flight turned back to its base, they spotted a gap in the cloud and descended. At only 1,400 feet above the ground, they crossed paths with a student pilot flying an Oxford trainer. The student pilot, Ernest Aubrey Griffin, was just under the clouds. It happened so fast that neither pilot had time to react. The time was 11.30 in the morning. Griffin was probably killed instantly. As for McGee, his Spitfire fell out of control toward the ground. He managed to bail out, but he was too low for his parachute to open. He had been in England for just six months, and in combat for only two. Not long after McGee's death, his poem was featured in newspapers across the United States. The Library of Congress hailed him as the first poet of the war. Pilot officer John Gillespie McGee's body was laid to rest in the village of Scopewick, not far from where he fell. His gravestone was inscribed with the first and last lines of his poem, Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth, put out my hand, and touched the face of God. McGee's poem reminds us not only of the joy and beauty of flight, but also of the true cost of war. His poem also reminds us of one of the Psalms of David. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. I'm Thomas Van Hare, and this is Historic Wings. If you like these videos, please subscribe and click like. Consider sponsoring us through Patreon or PayPal. And remember, there's always more to the story.